it working? All right, good morning, everyone. There we go. Here they start to come in, they're starting to come in. Here come our participants. How are you this Tuesday morning? Welcome back to College Talks um, Summer Series. Um, I'm glad that you're all here. And we have three great universities and um, admissions leaders um, presenting for us today. So I'm very excited about our presentation. Um, as I posted um, in my Facebook post uh, about this, uh, every single time I sit through one of these presentations, I just wanna go back to college. Um, so unfortunately I can't do that, but I do get to um, sit through these amazing presentations and I get to work with students as they explore um, their college options. And um, that is the fun part of my job. So I'm gonna just give it a few more um, seconds here for those who are coming in and we'll give you another minute or so, or maybe a little less to uh, get into the presentation, get yourself situated, and then I will go ahead and introduce our presenters. So today we have the University of Colorado Boulder presenting, Savannah College of Arts and Design, also known as SCAD, and Chapman University. So, and they're going to give you a ton of information about all of their um, institutions and we will have a Q&A at the end. And um, I already have a few questions that were submitted. And so I will go over those um, when we are um, at our Q&A. So down at the bottom of, or bottom or top, wherever you have it, there should be a little Q&A um, box with little text message, little, um, cartoon like looking things. Um, that's where you should go ahead and put your questions and we'll all be able to see them. Um, and once again, we'll do the Q&A at um, the end of the presentation after um, all three uh, leaders and um, universities have presented. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with um, our presentation. And as I said, this morning we have Chapman University University of Colorado Boulder and um, SCAD presenting. So I am going to introduce your presenters to you. So with um, Chapman University, I have Marie Burry. She's originally from Adams, Massachusetts. Marie graduated with a degree in interior design and a master's in business management from Mount Ida College in Newton, Massachusetts. Throughout college, Marie worked part-time in the admissions office as a student ambassador and admissions assistant while also spending much time in community service groups. Soon after graduation, Marie um, was offered an admissions counselor position primarily traveling in the Northeast and California. Having traded the East Coast for a new adventure in California, Marie is enjoying the Chapman community as her new family on the West Coast. Welcome, Marie. Thank you so much. Um, next, I have Kelsey Livingston, and she is the admissions counselor at the University of Colorado Boulder. And um, Kelsey is, is, a is a passionate writer who believes in the power of words and the importance of communication. Having grown up in California, she has a love for the ocean and the environmental factors that affect it. One of her main goals is to be a member of a community that values words, creativity, and people as much as she does, which is why she is proud to be part of the admissions team at CU Boulder. Kelsey actively recruits students, teaching them about the benefits of a college education and how she can best support them through the application process. Kelsey is passionate about working with high school students and loves that her job requires her to constantly learn new aspects of the university. Thanks, Kelsey. And last but not least, we have Jamie Freund, with, and she is the Assistant Director of Admissions at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Jamie has worked for the university for four years and is based in the metropolitan hub of Atlanta. Jamie originally hails from the state of New York, but has lived in the South, South for the last few years. She loves meeting students from all across the world and encouraging them in their pursuit of all things creative. Jamie's experience partner with a Bachelor of Arts in Professional Communication from Armstrong Atlantic University has prepared her as the Assistant Director of Admissions to assist students on their college journey. 
So there you have it. Those are your three presenters today. They are going to be giving you lots of great information about their institutions. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And um, first um, presenting to you is going to be Kelsey with the University of Colorado Boulder. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So before we get started, quick housekeeping. Uh, in the chat, I just put a link if um, the attendees could please fill that out. It's just your name, you know, email, birth date, just so I know that you attended and that you're interested in CU. Um, and if you end up, you know, not wanting our emails or whatever, really easy opt out process. So if you could fill that out for, for me, that would be great. Um, first things first, I'm Kelsey Livingston, as which was just mentioned. I'm originally from California, um, but I'm also a CU Boulder alumni. So really cool to kind of have that you know, experience of knowing what it's like to be from California and know what it's like to have gone to CU Boulder. Um, so before diving into kind of the fun aspects of CU and how to apply, I do just want to also address the elephant in the room, right? COVID, um, what we are doing um, and what the application process looks like and the changes that are being made. Um, so just to be very transparent with all of you, um, the Colorado um, state law requires that students um, apply for admission with an SAT or ACT test score. However, um, currently on our governor's desk is a bill to say for fall 2021, students do not need to submit a test score. Of course, that'll be very obvious when that is signed. Um, our website will reflect that, reflect that, our emails will reflect that, so don't worry. Um, we are really um, positive that is going to happen and you will know that when it happens as well. Um, however, I do just wanna say that for scholarship purposes, um, we do still need test scores, SAT, ACT, um, but you have until May 1st to get those into us. So plenty of time and um, I'll say this a couple times today, but if you have any questions, concerns about anything in the process, talk to me. I, I can't know if your testing center closed down or postponed unless you chat with me and, and that's the best way that I can give you uh, you know, more time if needed or work with you there. So got that out of the way and I'll talk more about the application process as we go. But um, as you see on the slide here is the statement, Be Boulder. Um, that is kind of our mission statement at CU. Um, and it kind of has the definition below, but I think Be Boulder um, means being bold in both the classroom and in your community. Uh, so you may notice that majority of our students are involved in more than one program on campus, as well as in more than one student organization. Um, on our next slide here, this is Emily Dobb and she is a student at CU Boulder and she is a um, engineering student, but you can see that she's also a dancer, which is really cool. And she's also a clothing designer. She created the clothing that she's wearing and put the LED lights on it to reflect the movements and the genders of the dancers that she wanted to convey. She received funding for this project through the university, or excuse me, the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program. Um, so she didn't spend any of her own money on this project. This was just for fun, for her own interest. Um, and so I really like this example to just show you what Be Boulder means because she's an engineer, she's a student, a researcher, a dancer, a designer, right? Uh, so something really cool there. The CU Boulder difference and, uh, you know, what it kind of really means to be a CU Boulder student, what we're doing, uh, you know, we are a Pac-12 school. We have academic options ranging from hundreds of majors to, uh, you know, multiple minors as well as certificate programs. Um, our classroom learning, of course, will look a little bit different this fall um, and later on in the process as well. But uh, know that while being a larger public institution, we really strive for that 18 to one student to faculty ratio. So the majority of your classes will be 50 students or less. Right now for the fall, we are you know, doing a more hybrid approach. So of course your classes will definitely be small to keep you safe, um, but also have some online um, opportunities for classroom as well. Uh, While well, being a Pac-12 university, we also, as mentioned with Emily Dobb, um, we are a tier one research institution and um, know that while, um, of course, that, you know, it may not be entirely safe to study abroad right now, we do have a study abroad office on campus. Um, then if you learned anything, of course, from what I've said so far, your safety is very important to us. Um, and so when it is, of course, safe to do that, um, know that those advisors are on campus to help you find what program is right for you um, and help you graduate um, on time as well. So moving on to the colleges and the academics that we have available on campus. Oh, one more slide, sorry, I, I went through this one, here we go. 
Um, the college, we have seven colleges on campus. I'm not going to talk through everyone too in, in depthly, but um, hopefully you see, uh, you know, a college that resonates to where uh, you know, your interests lie. College of Arts and Sciences being the largest ranging from, of course, arts and humanities uh, to the sciences. And just know in this track, we do have a pre-health program. So if you're interested in medicine, nursing, this that's where your kind of home will be in that college. Engineering and uh, our lead school of business are our nationally ranked colleges. So while none of our colleges or majors are impacted, you could say that those are our two um, most competitive colleges, if you will. Um, I always recommend students apply for their first choice major, but know that in those two colleges specifically, there is an open option route. So, you know, if you want just engineering or bus, know that there is an engineering open option pathway to apply for and then on campus, you know, change your major, double up on majors, maybe do a business minor. Uh, know that those are opportunities to be involved in those colleges without being a major as well. School of Education has an elementary education route to it, um, as well as, um, uh, excuse me, leadership studies, communication, um, information and media is our newest college, very hands-on. College of Music is conservatory style, so you will have to audition. And environmental design is where our architecture pathways lie. Uh, one program I want to um, definitely take a little more time to highlight today is our program in exploratory studies. And this is something you can apply for for your first year. And what it really means is that you have the opportunity to explore on campus. You know, maybe you're interested in business, but also education. Take some classes in both fields. This is uh, time for you to figure out what those passions are. And uh, keep in mind that this program will not add more time to your or add more time to your pathway. That's not the case. It was actually created to help you graduate in four years. So you have some more guidance your first year on campus. Um, also know that whatever major you apply for, you are always being considered for exploratory studies as kind of that second point of entry, if you will. So really unique program. I definitely encourage you to look into it further if it is of interest to you. So with academics on campus, how do our students live a balanced lifestyle? Um, Boulder is a very outdoorsy place. We have 300 days of sunshine, truthfully. I've lived here long enough to say that that's truly true. Um, but also, how do you create community on campus? Well, for first year students, we do require you to live in residence halls. Our first year students are still doing that. Um, definitely making sure we are keeping distances and some, uh, you know, maybe larger um, uh, rooms available for students for safety reasons, but here are two programs that are really unique to us. Residential academic programs have classrooms in your building. Great way to make friends, uh, have those study groups right away. And then the second one being living learning communities. So those are just halls of students of like interest. So while you may, you know, be in a residential academic program that has you know, a first year writing class or an acting class, uh, your living learning community will just, uh, you know, have folks who maybe all have the common interest of hiking or video gaming. Those are two examples of communities on campus. And if you don't want to be a part of either of those programs, uh, you can just opt for traditional housing and know that that is available as well. As for involvement on campus, I uh, alluded to that we have over 500 clubs and they really range to uh, kind of these uh, six panels here of what what are you interested in? These are just kind of to get you think about what are you doing in your current community and how can you bring that to a college setting? One that I especially like to point out here is the Entrepreneur um, Square. Uh, Boulder is one of the top cities in the U.S. for startup companies. And to name a, a, cool, uh, a couple of fun ones that I like, uh, Pop Sockets was started by a CU Boulder professor, uh, Justin's Peanut Butter, and Crocs, really fashionable shoes, all started in Colorado and specifically Boulder. So really cool, a great way to just get you thinking of, uh, take advantage of our research opportunities, right? You can get funding for your projects as well as funding to go network and go to conventions as well. So it doesn't just, you know, have to do with necessarily the STEM type field. If you have questions and want answers, um, we definitely have the resources for you there. Uh, here on this next slide is a picture of Boulder. If you've never been, um, the campus itself is really the heart of Boulder, the city. I like to say that everything in Boulder is walkable. If you want to get downtown or to a hiking trail, 10 minutes tops. Um, and also as a student, you get a bus pass. And so that's another great way to get around campus as well as to the airport which is really good to know. So um, again, kind of speaking to the kind of beautiful weather that we get um, and just being a really outdoorsy, um, very healthy community. 
So now I've talked about the fun stuff, what CU Boulder has to offer, how do you get here? So uh, we are completely located on the common application, um, which is um, convenient for a lot of you because a lot of colleges are on there. So that's all you need to look to to apply. Um, and if you have any questions, again, please reach out to me directly. I can help you through that process. Uh, here is our middle 50% of the students we admitted in 2019. So definitely emphasis on the fact that these are averages and not requirements. Um, so these are good goals, you know, going into your senior year. Um, of course, I already mentioned that SAT and ACT are looking to not be required um, for this next cycle. But again, good goals for the scholarship consideration. You are automatically considered for scholarships upon the application process. And we'll talk a little bit more about the ones you can apply to uh, later on as well. So next in line, next step we have is submitting all your application documents. Um, and here is a really great slide that has everything that you need to uh, apply um, or submit, I should say. So the application, like I said, on the Common App, two short essays, so that's the Common App essay and the CU Boulder essay. Um, if you have questions about that, again, reach out to me. And uh, that goes without saying with everything. Application fee, of course, um, there is a waiver you can fill out on the Common App should you believe you um, are considered for that. Official high school transcripts, um, but if you, you know, that means they have to come from your high school, but if you have any concerns with that or just can't get a hold of them, I realize those are the times we're in, please talk to me um, and we can work through getting those unofficial ones as well. Same with college transcripts, that's just if applicable, you know, taking community level coursework and things of that nature. Talked plenty about the scores. Uh, we require one academic letter of recommendation and this last checklist item says resume or activities list optional. I like to say encourage. You know, we participate in a holistic review and there's going to be a slide on that later on, but that just means that we want the full picture. You are more than just a number to us and so if you have more information you'd like to disclose to us that isn't just being conveyed in your essays, you can always email me after you submit the Common App or uh, use the Common App um, spaces to say more um, if needed. So here are the deadlines for the application. Um, there are two. Um, we have an early action deadline um, and that is completely non-binding and what I recommend all my students apply for because you find an admission decision in January before a whole pool of other applicants even get to applying. Um, so that's a really great way to be competitive and again, non-binding. So should you wanna go to another university, we will not hold that against you. You can absolutely decline. Um, so it's just a great way to just stay on top of things um, and um, just know also that there's that nice little buffer between November and January should you, you know, not get it in by that first deadline, which of course does not exist after January. So some things to consider. Um, moving back to that kind of holistic review approach we have, here is just a great visual example of what that means. So again, you're really just more than a number. Um, but of course, as you can see at the top of this kind of funnel, academics are important. We want to see you challenging yourself. We want to see your grade trends, of course, but you know, maybe you work, maybe you're a caretaker. Um, so definitely tell us those things so we can see the full picture and what you're doing both you know, in your school setting and as well as outside your school setting. So um, there's never too much information that you could tell us. Um, so next step along the process is make sure um, you have are using an email um, that we can get a hold of because this is where you will find all of the notifications about your um, application if, if we're missing anything as well. Um, and then next, of course, is um, maybe the most important part, understanding costs and funding. So here is a snapshot of tuition um, at CU Boulder. And I say snapshot because it's um, just kind of like an average. Uh, of course, on campus, room and board subject to change depending on where you live. Same with books and supplies depending on your major. But one thing that we're doing to kind of help alleviate these costs is keeping that cost the same all four years. Tuition guaranteed. So it's not going to go, um, you know, it's not going to increase on you. So definitely um, note that and of course pay attention to the financial aid deadlines. That is the other thing that you can do to be successful. Um, those important financial aid deadlines on that next slide there will show you that you know October 1 is where that financial or excuse me the FAFSA starts right. So what's really nice about that November 15th deadline um, with it being so early on is you can be doing other things as well right. So create these deadlines on this next slide here to just kind of help push you along the process, you know, FAFSA open, start working on it. November 1, CU Boulder scholarship application opens. While you are being considered automatically for some merit scholarships, 
this is when it opens and when you should be proactive and start applying to those. Even if CU is not your first choice, apply to these scholarships. It is so important because they don't want you in, you know, March to be making your final decision and be like, oh shoot, why aren't there any scholarships available to apply for anymore? So definitely be proactive about that. Um, I can't, can't stress that enough. Uh, so now that we've talked about, you know, what's at CU Boulder and how to get here, um, what's, what's after your time at CU? How do you, uh, you know, be successful? Uh, so this next slide here shows uh, kind of the average of students who are getting their first grad school as well as who are getting employed, um, going to the military after college. So definitely setting you up for success there, um, as well as this is a median salary for students um, in their first job after college. So of course, recognizing that, uh, you know, college is an investment, but what you put in is something you will get out. Here on this slide is probably one of my favorite ones just because it shows you um, all of the popular, if you will, uh, companies that students have gone on to work for. I like Google specifically because while that is in California, um, there's also a Google campus in Boulder, Colorado too. So um, this is where I just like to say that if you wanna go back home where you're from and work there, of course there are opportunities available there, but you can also uh, you know, get a lot in the Denver area as well as Boulder. Uh, and we do have a career services office on campus that you can utilize during your time at CU as well as when you, after you graduate as well. So if you ever still need help finding a job or just need some extra advice on a cover letter, they're there for you as well. Once a buff, always a buff. Uh, so thank you so much for your time today. Um, if you have any questions, uh, of course, my information will be at the end. Um, but again, my name is Kelsey Livingston from CU Boulder and I am now going to pass it off to Jamie. Jamie, before you um, start, Kelsey, we did have um, a question. Um, I'm not a question. The questions we're going to save till the end. So um, those of you who asked the questions, I promise you they will be answered um, at the end of the presentation. But somebody tried to um, get the link that you put into the chat box, and I guess they were having trouble doing that. So can you um, post it one more time in the chat box, the link, so that they can um, access that? Absolutely, yeah, I'll, I'll get to it right now. Thank All you. Right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Jamie, sorry we interrupted. Totally fine, no worries. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started, everyone. Um, uh, earlier in my introduction, well, they gave my name. My name is Jamie Freund. I am an assistant director of admission with the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, same as Kelsey, I'm gonna go ahead and post a link to request more information about SCAD if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about the university and what we have to offer. Um, but without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share a little bit more information with you guys. Um, we are the University for Creative Careers and that encompasses a lot of different areas. And I'm gonna talk through a couple of those things with you. But first, I want to start talking about our campus locations. Uh, SCAD was founded back in 1978. We opened our doors for the first time in 1979. Our primary location is in Savannah, Georgia. Um, Savannah, Georgia, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a really beautiful little southern city, very historic, um, a very whimsical feel right along the coast. It's about 20 minutes away from the beach, so you do have access to that. Um, Savannah is going to be our largest location that we have for students. We have roughly 11,000 students and we have about 80 buildings spread throughout the historic district of Savannah and those will serve as your classroom spaces. Similarly, we have a campus in Atlanta, Georgia, about four hours north. Um, Atlanta is going to be different from Savannah in the sense that it is in a much larger city and it is a smaller SCAD. So kind of a comparison there, a lot of people will ask, uh, what is the difference between Savannah and Atlanta? And Savannah is going to be a larger SCAD, but in a smaller city. And then Atlanta will be a smaller SCAD, but in a larger city for a comparison there. In Atlanta, we have roughly 3,000 students and access to a lot of Fortune 500 companies and tons of different opportunities for students to work and apply the skills that they are learning. Then we also have a study abroad opportunity for students in Lacoste, France. So obviously, given the situation right now, that is going to be um, something that we're kind of evaluating for students for this upcoming year. But hopefully next year, we will be able to resume students going to this location. Every student coming to SCAD or accepted to SCAD will have an opportunity to go to SCAD Lacoste to study. It is a very beautiful, really small medieval village pulled away from civilization. You spend about 10 weeks there. During midterms week, every student is sent off to Paris. You spend a week staying across the street from the Louvre Museum, touring different museums and exhibitions and whatnot, and really getting to enjoy the experience and just being in Europe overall. 
Um, and then we also offer online classes as well. So a lot of our degree programs are offered fully online. That has been really helpful for our students at this current time um, in history. So as they are working on completing their degree programs, this has allowed them to continue their studies without having to slow down. Um, something I do want to say as well is if you're applying to SCAD and are accepted to SCAD, you are applying and accepted to every single SCAD campus. So technically speaking, if you wanted to go to Savannah, pop through Atlanta, go to, uh, go to Lacoste, do online courses, swing back to Savannah or Atlanta to finish your degree, you're more than welcome to do that. The university is also incredibly diverse. We have approximately 15,000 students representing all 50 states and more than 100 countries. So this is something that I really love about SCAD. You see this when you visit campus and hopefully those of you who are interested will be able to come on a campus tour at some point in the future. But our students from all over the place, we have about 30% of our student body in total is going to be international students. And this is so important for students who are looking to pursue something creative, to have those different uh, influences, different backgrounds, people from different upbringings and countries. Um, it's definitely going to serve you very well in your creative pursuits. And then on top of that, we offer more programs of study and specializations than any other art and design university in the US. So we have a total of 44 different majors and 75 minors. What you're gonna see here on the screen is going to be just a small reflection of what we do offer. Um, a lot of times when people are looking at an art and design school or thinking about an art school, it's easy to associate an art and design school with simply painting and drawing and more fine art majors. But something that I love about SCAD as well is kind of the, the depth of the offerings that we do have. They're gonna vary from more STEM related programs like industrial design, if you're looking to do product design, architecture, interior design, game design, um, lots of different offerings. So if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more, I would really encourage you to check out our website um, to be able to explore a lot of those majors more in depth. But at SCAD, our curriculum is constantly evolving. We wanna make sure that our students are up to speed with the fast changing professions that they will hopefully go on to lead. So that is definitely a priority for us. Career preparation will be the foundation of everything that our students do learn at the school. And that will be evidenced by our employment rate that you guys are gonna see pop up here in just a second. So 99% of our spring 2017 and 2018 alumni were either employed, pursuing further education, or both within 10 months of graduation. That extraordinary number is not only a testament to how talented and ambitious our students are, but it also speaks volumes about the quality of a SCAD education in a global economy where creativity and innovation continue to be prized more and more. To break that number down for you guys just a little bit, 92% um, of the 99 are employed within their creative field of study that they pursued at SCAD. The remaining percentage is either working on another degree, say a master's degree or a second bachelor's, or they're working in a field that is unrelated to what they pursued at the university. So I just wanna help you guys, uh, hopefully this information is helpful for you. I know that the starving artist is something that is also easy to associate with students who are interested in a creative pursuit, but something we have seen is an upward tick in society and kind of industries. Um, creative professions are in very high demand. And so hopefully this will encourage students who are interested in pursuing those fields. And at SCAD, we do champion a small class setting as well and individualized attention for our students. We wanna make sure that you are able to learn one-on-one -on -one from your professors. We have a 20 to one student professor ratio. Um, we cap our lecture classes at 30 students total. And then uh, your major classes will be kept at 20 students. The further into your major that you actually get, the odds of your class being uh, kind of shrinking a little bit increases as well. So it's pretty typical that you're in a class with about 15, 15 to 20 students students the further into your major you get. But you're going to be learning one-on-one -on -one from, from instructors with experience at the world's top companies and studios. This is Andrew Reeve Rabb. She is the Dean of our School of Entertainment Arts and she's also the former director of um, CBS Casting. So she casted shows like Big Bang Theory, How I Met Your Mother, all of the NCISs and all of the CSIs. But she is, we are pretty particular with who we allow to teach at SCAD. We require that they all have at least 10 years worth of industry experience before they're allowed to teach at SCAD. 
Um, we also don't offer tenure for our professors. That will prevent stagnation. They have to continue to develop their curriculum and stay relevant in these fields. And so that's something that we really do prioritize. We want you to learn from some of the top or the best in the field. And that's a way that we do make sure that you guys are able to have that experience. So there's that. But across every discipline, um, SCAD professors are experts who are dedicated to helping you build the skill sets you need for a thriving career in art and design. I do want to say too, SCAD is a fully accredited university. So with nationally and internationally recognized academic degree programs, including our award-winning fashion department, which consistently earns high praise from the business of fashion, which is also considered the world's ultimate resource for fashion creatives around the world. And then our interior design program has been ranked number one in America's best architecture and design schools by Design Intelligence. We have won this award eight times and it is something we are very proud of. And then our motion media design program is considered one of the best in the world by the Rookies, which is an international competition dubbed the Oscars for Creative Minds. And our students also win top awards. So this is a picture of a team that took first place in Walt Disney's Imagineering's design competition um, this past year. This is marking the second year in a row that we have taken first and second place. So as you can see, we are still pretty excited about that. Then our architecture program is one of the few in the country that features the groundbreaking integrated path to architecture licensure. So for those of you who might be interested in architecture, you are probably very aware of how long it takes to get an architect's license. It typically takes anywhere from 11 to 15 years, but with the expedited IPAL program, you can actually condense that to a seven year period. So at SCAD, you will have access to that. You don't, it's not required. If you enter the architecture program, you can do your typical BFA in architecture and then also get your master's and then go through the licensing separately. But if you want to participate in the expedited track, just know that that will be an option for you at SCAD. The Hollywood Reporter places our production design program and costume design minor among the top in the nation and the world with graduates who work at major studios and film companies, as do the graduates of our illustration program and animation programs who are mastering multiple forms of production and animation um, in a program lauded by the Animation Career Review. Some 150 SCAD alumni contributed to this year's lineup of Academy Award winning films, including Avengers Infinity War, Incredibles 2, which is one of my personal favorites, If Beale Street Could Talk, Black Panther, and then Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Every single year, we also host special events for students. Um, we're able to premiere a lot of the films that I mentioned previously at our film festival. It happens every single fall. This is an amazing opportunity for students interested in performing arts, film and TV, production design, anything entertainment arts related. Um, but throughout the rest of the year as well, we also host a fashion show. It's a really, really popular event. We also do define art, fine art exhibitions for students in those majors, and then other open studios as well to make Make sure that we're, the public is able to see our students work. Another thing I want to mention is we really want to highlight how students get experience at SCAD. So we have a program called SCAD Pro where students actually come up with design solutions for global brands and they have partnered with NASA, Delta, our current one we're doing with Uber Elevate. It's been delayed a little bit due to co COVID-19, um, but what the project we're working on with Uber right now is they're actually in process of designing flying Ubers. So a lot of our industrial design students are on this project. It's set to launch in 2023. Um, we'll see how far the delays kind of push us back. But that is currently something that our students are working on. And these are students at the undergraduate level who are giving their feedback and expertise. And so these are amazing ways for them to get experience put on their resumes. And then hopefully those things will be pushed to market. So since we've had this opportunity for students, we have collaborated with 500 companies, 300 plus brand partners and pushed 150 products to market. So this is amazing for SCAD students to really build their resumes, portfolios and uh, share the work that they are creating and doing. In terms of admission, I want to shift gears a little bit and kind of talk to you guys about how to come to SCAD. 
Um, so our process is going to be pretty simple. Honestly, uh, we operate on rolling admission, which means that we accept applications up to two years in advance of when you would want to attend and then up to 30 days prior to the beginning of the quarter in which you would like to attend as well. So I don't recommend the latter. I would say give yourself for sure about six months at least, but um, the process will be pretty straightforward and simple. We also want to make sure that you have somebody to kind of walk you through the steps as well. So the initial application itself is mostly demographic asking for your name, birthday, email address, school information. Um, this is available on our website at scad.edu slash apply. It's also available through Common App. So if you guys are filling out the Common App, you can add SCAD that way as well. After you submit that, you'll submit a $50 application fee, and then you're assigned to an admission advisor who will guide you through the rest of the process. That will involve the submission of test scores, transcripts, portfolio, resume, and any ad additional materials that you might need to submit to complete your file, but they will walk you through your entire checklist, making sure that you feel confident and ready to submit the materials that you do have. Um, and you will again have up until the 30 day marker before you start to get all of those materials in. Um, so students who are kind of working on last minute portfolio pieces, it does give you a nice window. You will automatically be reviewed for both academic and achievement based scholarship upon the submission of those materials. So you don't have to worry about missing that as well. Um, and then I would say, you know, Working with your advisor, you're going to work on completing your file. We would also encourage you guys to visit. Obviously, things being what they are right now, all of our on-campus tour operations are currently paused and we're not sure when those are going to resume. But we are doing virtual tours. If you were to go to scad.edu slash visit, we will have an opportunity for you guys to actually do video tours through all of the buildings. Prior to shutdown, all of our SCAD students really came together and they actually created content for our prospective students to go and watch so that you can actually see the interior spaces of our program buildings and get an idea for what it will look like. Obviously, this is not a replacement of you guys coming to campus, um, but it is a nice way for you to get a better sense of the school and what we do have to offer. And then I would encourage you guys to connect with us. So we are on all different social media platforms. If it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, live chat, we are constantly updating with different content, special events, special guests. We have also done a ton of free webinars for prospective students as well. If you want to kind of see a little bit more of what the SCAD experience is like, you can feel free to check us out there to see the latest updates and whatnot. And I'm going to kind of come to a close here. Um, hopefully I shared a lot of information with you guys that was really helpful. I hope that this is giving you some insight and giving you some tools to go and research and see if SCAD is a good fit for you. But I know that there are so many reasons to choose SCAD, um, but I'll, you know, all of them are going to culminate in this moment here. This is actually a picture of one of our graduation cer ceremonies. Um, so, you know, something we really want to prioritize is making sure that our students feel supported, like they are equipped and they do have the skills necessary to go be in su successful in these career fields that hopefully um, we can help you get into. So. All of that to say, I also want to post this here for those of you who are looking to learn more about SCAD, you can actually scan this QR code with your phone camera. And I'll actually take you directly to a link. If you didn't fill out the link that was in the chat box, this will take you to that same link. So you can scan that, get on our mailing list. We can send you a catalog in the mail. Um, also, we can update you with different events uh, that we have going on virtually. And then maybe come spring, if we're back in the area traveling and whatnot, we can give you information about other things as well. I'm um, just making sure that you do stay up to date. So, but that concludes my presentation and I'm going to hand it over to Marie. All right, thanks, Jamie. Um, it's nice to, I wish this was in person and how we were able to see all of each other and um, spend a little bit more time in person, but um, it's nice to meet all of you virtually nonetheless. My name is Marie and I am one of our associate directors of admission at Chapman. And so you learned a little bit about me from my bio earlier. I am a New Englander at heart, um, but have been in here in California and working at Chapman. Um, this is my sixth year now. So excited to be with you all and, and sharing a little bit more insight in terms of what comes next in this application process and as you navigate the steps of 
finding the right institution that's the right fit for you and the right program and, and moving all of those things forward. So with that being said, similar to my colleagues, I am going to post a link that's going to be in the chat of this as well. You're welcome to click that and that will ask for some other information, some high school specific information too, and that will put you into our system. I'll talk a little bit more about what this particular piece means. Um, the idea of demonstrated interest and all of that is a big conversation that we often have as we're going through this admission process with our students too. So if you're interested in Chapman, feel free to fill that out. I also want to be sure that we're addressing the, the big piece and the big question that everybody's asking right now is what comes next with regard to COVID. And so COVID-19 has changed everybody's plans for everything, right? And, and we're very understanding of that too. One of the ways that COVID has really changed our campus right now is at least in the virtual tours and not having students on campus and, and all of that for the time being. As of right now, we are planning for, fingers crossed, right, planning for an upcoming fall semester that will be a little bit um, similar to what has been traditional in the past. We have done, I think, as a university, a really great job taking care of our students, taking care of our staff members, hosting different town halls, hosting different um, webinars to talk about COVID and how our students can help. In fact, our engineering students actually um, in the spring semester took right into action and they were jumping in to create some um, PPE for our local um, Orange County hospitals and things like that as well. So there are a lot of different ways that this has changed and this has in actually impacted our students and, and allowed them to give back to the community. Like many of our my colleagues and any institution really almost across the US or the world right now, it's hard to go and visit campus, right? And so you can find some um, virtual opportunities that are on our website. There are a couple um, little URLs and things that are in here as well. So you're welcome to type those in and, and save them for a later point. We also have right on our main website a link that says Ask a Student, and that is a great way to get to know Chapman a little bit better. Obviously, if you were on campus, you'd be able to ask your tour guide those specific questions that you have. And that Ask a Student platform allows you to select a student that has maybe a particular major that you're interested in or is from your region, has certain background that you're looking for, anything along those lines, and you're able to chat with them. So definitely utilize that as a potential resource. When it comes to the testing component in terms of SAT, ACT, that has been a big change for COVID in terms of what we've seen across the United States. I'm happy to say that Chapman over the last probably at least five years since I've been at Chapman um, has really been in this conversation of should we be looking at SAT or ACT scores and how much of a predictor are those for success in the classroom once a student is here on campus. And so with that being said, we did a lot of institutional research to pull that data and see what that looked like and came to the conclusion that no, that test score is not a direct correlation for every student as they go into the classroom moving forward. And so because of that, we did decide to move to test optional. And so you are still welcome to submit SAT or ACT scores while this relates to COVID. Um, and it came with a perfect timing at before coronavirus really hit everything here in the United States. Um, but this wasn't a move for us that was directly in reaction to coronavirus. So just something to mention, and we'll talk a little bit more in terms of the admission process and everything um, like that moving forward too. But to give you an introduction into at least who Chapman is, where we're located, give you a little bit of an overview, we are in Orange, California. So the city of Orange in the heart of Orange County. If you know where Disneyland is in Southern California, you probably know where we are. We're about 10 minutes from there. So um, I often joke with our students, it's a little bit of a perk. You can um, go to the top floor of one of the parking garages on campus or even some of the residence halls every night and see the fireworks from Disney. So um, maybe a fun perk for you. And so the city of Orange in and of itself is really this wonderful kind of quaint college town. And that 
is, is such an extension of our campus. So you have your campus setting and then right around the corner, all walking distance, is this downtown area where there's lots of different shops and eateries and coffee shops and things like that too. You can definitely grab your laptop and your earbuds and just go and plug in or go to a club meeting there or some of our students are certainly utilizing that for meetings with professors and, and things along those lines as well. We are not all that far from Los Angeles and we're not all that far from San Diego. So when you're looking um, in terms of where we are kind of situated in between, LA can obviously take with, depending on traffic, and I always joke with people, it can take half an hour to get there, it could take five hours to get there, right? Like we all know the LA, the LA traffic. And so um, that's another element, but certainly provides a variety of other resources. We are about two to three blocks away from our local train station as well. So as you're navigating this next step of the process too, it's important to note that we're close to the train station. So if you don't wanna deal with that LA traffic, or even if you wanna head farther down towards San Diego or explore a little bit more of Orange County, you have the ability to do that um, all from walking distance to campus. We are one of the largest private institutions in California and also one of the oldest private institutions in California as well. Um, we have about 7,600 undergraduate students and that's really going to break down when you're thinking about the in-classroom experience to about 23 students on average in your class. So for a lot of high school students, that's not all that much different than what they're experiencing in their high school classes. It certainly allows you to have the more personalized interaction with your faculty members, and it allows you to then not just utilize that from the academic experience, but also when you're thinking about jobs and internships and all of that moving forward as well. They'll certainly be helpful. They'll know your name. You won't be able to hide in that classroom because they're going to know who you are. Um, especially so with this upcoming semester, we're actually lowering the number of students in each of our classrooms right now too to make sure that we can maintain that little bit of extra social distancing um, with regard to coronavirus and everything there too. So even more of a little bit of a personalized experience coming forward too. When you're looking at all of these other pieces and, and what Chapman can offer you in terms of that academic experience, there are so many different majors and minors and then a variety of different schools and colleges at the university. It would take me a while to go through each one of these. Each of these has so much information behind them, so many different programs, so many exciting new things happening, and so many wonderful faculty members. I would love to spend the time to go through each of them with you, but in the, um, in the aspect of time that this afternoon, I want to make sure that you at least have a broad perspective of what this looks like. Now, when you're choosing a specific major at Chapman, you can choose that right from the application stage or you're welcome to choose that later. I do have a good percent of students that are coming in undeclared. And so when you're thinking about that piece of the puzzle too, you don't have to have it all figured out. A lot of our students some of them will change their major, some of them will add a second major, some of them will add a minor. All of these pieces will really kind of pull together as you're going through those next steps too. When you think about that full academic experience at Chapman, one of the things that I think is a really key element of that Chapman education is this idea to personalize it. It's really written right into our mission statement. We also really want to focus on that idea of global citizenship, and so I'm going to talk about how those different pieces work. The personalization component is a big piece at Chapman. And so when you're thinking about that, every student has obviously the courses that are required by your individual major of study. Then you also have this general education curriculum. Your general education curriculum at Chapman is really pretty diverse in the courses that are offered to fulfill each area of study. So it's not gonna look the same as your very prescribed high school transcript where you're moving through this curriculum and you're required to take this class your first year and sophomore year and you know junior and senior year moving forward. Um, it's certainly not that prescribed and you have a, a little bit of freedom to really move throughout that. Outside of these two pieces, every student at Chapman is actually required to take a course, courses outside of both that general education and outside of their major. We call this a themed inquiry. That themed inquiry is a set of four classes. That set of four can kind of be brought to like an up level if you wanted to do that and choose to take on a second major in that place. Some students choose to take on a minor in that place. And some students that are also really ambitious will opt to do um, 
several minors in that place as well. Now, all of this is certainly going to depend on what your individual major of study is and then how much freedom and flexibility you have within that as well and what, what's taking up that time. And so all of these pieces are ways that our students can add in extra pieces to your education, really making sure that you're personalizing to what you're looking for. To give you an example, I had a student just a couple of years ago that was a engineering student. He was computer science. Uh, major and then also was really creative and musically gifted and so through that he was also a music um, music minor and so it was really cool to see a student that jumped from the school of engineering to the college of performing arts and was able to toggle between the two of those not necessarily two things that you think are um, all that possible when you're thinking of those next steps too when it comes to that idea of global citizenship, obviously that's really important. You might have seen from the last slide that we have over 80 different countries represented in our student body. And when you're looking at that, I think it's really helpful to see that they're not all, all of our international students aren't coming from one particular region of the world or one particular country. And so it's really giving you that diversity in your classroom. When you're thinking about that and how that relates to your actual curriculum at Chapman, that's directly going to correlate with what we call our global citizens cluster. That global citizens cluster is a set of courses that are required as part of general education to take in something related to global study, something related to a like citizenship community service um, kind of realm. All of our students are also required to take a world language up to a 200 level. So if you're coming in with um, starting at that 100, 101 level, um, as a lot of students are, you'll have about three semesters of a world language. Now, some of these courses in that global citizens cluster can be fulfilled by doing a study abroad program. About 50% of our Chapman students are going through a study abroad program as well, so that's a good thing to mention. They're really going all over the world. I've seen some students that have gone um, out to Asia. I've seen some students that have gone um, to Europe and South America and Africa and really all over. We do also have the full semester options as well as what we call interterm. It's that semester that's situated right in between the fall and spring semester. And so your inner term when you're speaking about that is actually already included in the cost of attendance for Chapman. So when you're paying for the credit for that class, there's no extra fees or anything associated with that. It's already included. If you are opting to do a study abroad program or travel during that time, the only extra fees that you would have during that would be your travel expenses. So it's a huge benefit to our students to certainly utilize that. Some courses are also offered on campus during interterm. So that can help our students start to speed up their education or when you're thinking about those themed inquiries and other pieces, really fitting in every little piece of the puzzle that you want to fit in. Because of interterm, we've actually had about 20% of our Chapman students that are graduating in less than four years. So with that, um, again, like it, I mentioned, it allows you to speed it up a little bit. So some students opt to graduate a little bit early. I also had a student a couple of years ago, um, actually I think it was like last year at this time, that she actually knew she could graduate early and so instead of opting for that she actually moved away for the spring semester of her junior year she went and moved to atlanta and she worked at cnn headquarters and so she had this entire semester where she was really able to dedicate to a very specific internship that was of interest to her and then move back to campus and graduate as planned with her in her class and so there are different ways that you can integrate that Another key element of the Chapman education is this hands-on experience. I know from my own background that when I was a high school student and going into college that if a faculty member had just said, okay, we're gonna, here's a textbook, we're just gonna lecture and this is going to be what it looks like for the entirety of the semester, that would not have worked well for me. And so as you're looking through those next steps of the process, that might not work well for many of you either. It just depends on your own individual learning style. Every student at Chapman has the ability to jump into their major of study in your first semester of your first year. So when you're thinking about how does this all work together, that general education, your major, maybe a minor, and other pieces you want to declare once you're here, you're able to start in those right away. A couple of examples for you. Our School of Engineering actually has this program that's called um, Grand Challenges Initiative. And this Grand Challenges Initiative is a 
um, research opportunity in your first semester of your first year, which isn't necessarily typical when you're thinking about research opportunities at the undergraduate level. So our students come in and their whole goal with this kind of first year foundational course is really to start solving problems with science. And it's a three semester long process or sequence of courses and you get to start that as early as that first semester. So when you're thinking about it, it's a good thing to think, um, okay, I can really get to jumpstart in, in these next steps of the process. You might also be a business-minded student and wanting to create your own business. We have a program that's called Launch Labs. That's an entrepreneurial space on campus where students are able to start their own businesses. We also have certainly performances and art and things like that that our students can get into from the College of Performing Art. Or maybe you're within our Dodge College of Film and Media Art and you're getting your hands on a camera or creating character or plans for story development for television or anything like that. You have the ability within each one of your programs, regardless of what school or college you're coming into, to get your hands dirty on that. So it's a helpful piece as you're, as you're looking forward. Now, it's a lot I could spend really the whole day talking to you about what the education looks like at Chapman and what that culture and community looks like, but I also want to spend a little bit more time in terms of that admission um, information because I know for many of you that's coming really soon. So as you're thinking about this, we have a good number of applicants that are um, coming into the university every year. You can see these here and you can see our admission averages just in total here. Again, I mentioned at the beginning that there's no need to submit SAT or ACT scores moving forward. That's entirely up to you. If you have SAT or ACT scores that you think are going to be beneficial to your admission, you're welcome to submit those, but not required of you. The other piece that you're thinking about in, in looking at this too is in terms of that average GPA and these are really the average test scores. These are averages. They are not a requirement or threshold you need to meet in order to apply to Chapman. These are averages. So important to look at when you're thinking about those next steps. Now, I wanna talk about deadlines. <laughs> That's coming so soon for you. So when you're looking at that, like my colleagues that are on here too, I know much like Kelsey mentioned, there's some early action um, and then there's regular decision a little bit later. Chapman has a couple of different pieces that are coming into play here. So with November 1st is early action and early decision. Early decision being a binding commitment, meaning that if you're applying early decision, you're only applying to Chapman early decision or to one institution. It's your 100% first choice institution. Essentially, you're putting all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak, and saying, if I get accepted to this institution, I'm making a commitment to attend. There are a couple of programs that have a priority deadline within November 1st. It's up to you as a student if you want to submit as early action or early decision within that. Those programs are listed here on the screen, but they're film production, our screen acting program, theater performance, dance, and our first year early assurance program, it's a pre-pharmacy program. And so that's a five-year doctorate in pharmacy. And so if you're interested in any of those particular programs, you'll want to make sure you're hitting submit by November 1st. Now the pieces that you'll really need by November 1st are your common application, and you'll also need your creative supplement if you're applying to a, what we call a talent-based program. Anything that requires a audition, portfolio, something extra that's in that creative realm, you'll want to make sure both of those are submitted by the 1st. Some students will opt to submit at a later date, that's January 15th, in regular decision. Many students will ask me on a year, yearly basis when I'm giving presentations or visiting high schools, well, which should I apply? Should I, do, should I apply early? Should I apply regular? What does that look like? Generally speaking, I do gen, generally recommend our students apply early. My reasoning for that is really twofold. The first component as you're thinking about that next step of the process is that it builds in a little bit more time. So if we're going through this application process and say we need a little bit extra information before we can make that admission decision, that's absolutely okay. We can always roll that application over to regular decision. It buys us a little bit more time, allows us to see some more information and ask you some questions, whereas regular decision doesn't necessarily have that, we don't have a next deadline to roll over to. And the other component I think about is the spaces in the class as well as the funding that's available to you. We have merit-based scholarships that range from $10,000 to $32,000 each year. You're automatically considered for those. There's no extra check boxes or essays or anything like that. That's an automatic consideration in the process. 
And so when you're going through this, I tell students that in the early round, we have a completely clean slate. There's not any new students in that class yet. We're looking at everything with a fresh set of eyes. And so when you start to think about regular decision, a good number of the spaces for both um, offers of seats in the class as well as potential scholarship funds that we have, a really strong percentage of that has already been allocated to other applicants in the early round. So all good things to make sure you're looking at and considering as you move forward through that process. So how do we review applications and what do we focus on? There's so many pieces of holistic admission and Kelsey mentioned this too, like they, she showed this funnel of like all of these different elements that really go through in this holistic piece. And so we're quite similar in that. There's so much that we're focusing on. There's not one particular thing that is a make or break for any individual applicant. So obviously, first and foremost, like any institution across the United States, we're looking at your academics. We want to make sure that you're going to be successful as a student in the classroom at Chapman. That's obviously very important for us. We're also going to look at that in the context of the major that you're hoping to apply into as well. So when you're thinking about that added piece, if you're interested in, say, a math program or a business program, which is very math dominant, we're going to be looking at those math um, classes that you've taken, the scores that you've gotten in those particular courses, um, if you've challenged yourself, what type of rigorous curriculum you've taken on, and what was offered to you within your high school. We'll look at all of those different pieces, and then to tie in that major of study as well, we're certainly asking our students why you want to study a particular major, and that will be included in that, that part of the review as well. Our Chapman community is really it is really involved. I'd say it's very typical to see students with so many different um, areas of interest and so many different um, like clubs, organizations, different things that they want to be a part of. There's two, over 200 different clubs and organizations at the university. And so that comes into the application process as well. We want to make sure that you're going to be a participant in the community at Chapman. We want to be able to see what things you're going to join into, what new ideas you're going to bring to campus, maybe new clubs or organizations that you might come with, um, all different things that we'll get to see there. Now, I also tell students on the common application, there's many spaces that are available when you're thinking about that involvement. Don't feel the pressure that you need to fill out every single space. It's okay if you don't. In fact, we would rather see a student that instead of doing something for just a shorter period of time and over the you know over four years that you were involved in one club for like one hour and then you didn't touch it again for another like six months or three months um, we would rather see a student that is more committed to a particular area of their involvement is that you're leading a club or something on your um, high school campus is that you're part of an athletics team and you became captain and you've taken on a leadership role is that your student government or is that uh, being a leader in your community and um, giving back through community service, having a part-time job absolutely counts in there too. All different things that we're really looking for. Ultimately, and at the end of the day, we're looking for the student that is going to be both academically successful at Chapman, that's also going to be a student that will be active in the campus community too. That's really important. In the common application, we ask a couple of questions that are why you're excited about us as an institution. Please go on the website, please do your research, look at those different things and tell us really why you're excited to be a, a Chapman student in the future. It's easy to rely on things like there's the beaches are closed and it's, it's sunny frequently and um, Disneyland is close by, but those are things that are um, also quite related to many of our other counterpart institutions that are located in Southern California. So keep that in mind as you're going forward and, and really be able to express that interest as you're thinking about Chapman specifically. And there's so many fun pieces that we ask too. My favorite piece at the end of the application, we ask a series of like fast fact questions. Um, they're quick like one-off little things that we want to get to know you. So it's really important that we see you as an individual and not just looking at this number, that number, and all of those different pieces moving forward. We want to see that whole individual person since educating that person, whole person, is really important to us um, once you're here on campus as well. When you're thinking about beyond Chapman and, and what a Chapman degree will help you with, here's a quick little snapshot of just a few companies that Chapman has 
partnerships with and is working actively with on a regular basis. So you'll see a lot of names that you certainly recognize here. Orange County and LA are certainly a hub for so many different organizations, everything from the small startup organizations to Fortune 500 companies, major accounting firms, places like Disney and Target and, and everything in between. And so there's so much that's going on, so much that you're able to jump into. A really good percent to, um, to give you a couple statistics here is that 91% of Chapman students are completing a culminating experience as part of their um, final uh, studies at Chapman. And so that is essentially a thesis or a final project or creating a final business plan or education plan. It certainly depends on which individual major that you're in, but that's an added piece. And then about 75% of our students are jumping into at least one internship as you're thinking about this too. That interterm time in between that fall and spring semester that I mentioned can be a really great time for students to utilize um, different internships as well. So all opportunities that you'll have moving forward when you think about that. I, again, I could talk about Chapman for a while, so I hope that we'll stay in contact from here moving forward. Again, my name's Marie, and you'll have my contact information at the very end. I know that will pop up on our slides, um, but if you do want any more insight on Chapman or just want to follow up, want to talk to a student or anything like that, you're welcome to reach out to me, um, and you're also welcome to fill out that link that I posted in our chat so you can get a little bit more information. Marie, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, so like I said at the very beginning, every time I do one of these every Tuesday, I just want to press the rewind button and I want to go back and, and attend school um, and figure out what new major I can, um, I can um, you know, figure out what I can do with my life as a, you know, a new, new career. Um, when we had our practice session, Marie, Jamie, and Kelsey and I, um, I was joking that uh, I should go back and I should spend a semester at all of these schools and create a new degree where then I can um, be like a personal shopper kind of thing where I can come back and um, find those, those things for students. Um, that would be really fun uh, to go and take classes of, in things that I would have never done when um, I was in college. So with that said, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit about what it is that I do and um, how I can help with regards to the uh, various um, applications and how they are different. We do have quite a bit of questions, which I'm about to um, get to as soon as I'm done with this. But um, I have various options available to students and families, um, ranging in price. Um, the, my master class, which was launched, launched in June, actually we are in june so it was launched at the beginning of this month um it'll go for 12 months so it um it'll go until you have decision day in may um and it is a monthly live uh facebook session um that is with other like-minded students and um it is in a it's in a group setting which will allow you to um focus on a certain piece of your application um, of what, pe what piece of that application is important for that month um, as we're going through. So, you know, if you're having to build a portfolio and you're writing an essays and, you know, supplemental essays and, you know, what deadlines you have to meet and all of those things. So on a monthly basis, there will be a, a themed topic and we'll get through those. You'll have access to a proprietary tool called the Kited Path, which will allow you to keep all of your um, information in one area. And that will, um, uh, uh, you know, keep all your your application materials and in, in organized and, and ready to go. Um, then I have three various comprehensive packages, um, you know, that are my D3 package, my D2 package, and my D1 package, you know, my standard select and IV. Uh, the standard package basically um, gets you through the entire um, application process without any type of essay support um, but you know helping you find that right fit build a college list um, you know figure out whether you're applying early action um, early decision regular decision rolling admissions you know what is best for you um, and finding that fit of that school where you're going to go and you're going to find you're going to find your peeps and you're and you're going to feel at home uh, you know where is that you know is it going to be across the country or is it just going to be an hour or two away from home 
Um, then the comprehensive package, which is my um, upperclassman D2, um, that one does have essay support and um, SAT, ACT support also, although right now, who knows what is going to happen with that. Um, it includes the uh, support for um, your main essay on your common app or your main essay for, um, you know, a co for the coalition app or UCAS or whatever um, application system you're using, um, one main or personal statement. Um, and then you have the Ivy package, which includes an aptitude assessment and then all of your essays, including your supplementals. And that's just kind of the whole big bang shebang um, of uh, support there. Um, and basically, these are all the things that um, are included in there. You have, you know, that interest profile assessment, your academic resume, your college essays, your educational career path objectives, who and when to ask for letter of recommendations, which was a question that Max asked, and we're going to address that right now um, to each one of them. Financial planning, um, whether that be um, FAFSA, um, federal methodology, or institutional methodology with CSS profile or um, you know, looking at what types of merit and scholarship aid um, is available to you. Um, what parts of that extracurricular and summer activities you know, should you be putting on um, your resume? Uh, you know, as Marie said, you know, things that you've been involved in for years or your little one-offs that you've had, which ones are gonna make more of an impact? Um, and then prep for standardized tests. And as I said, those are kind of up in the air across the board. Some schools are requiring them still and others aren't. So um, how to prep and, um, and when to prep. For those of you that are not juniors who have popped on today, I do have um, the same type of thing, but it's per semester rather than on a monthly membership. Um, and those are the same thing. They're you know D3, D2, and um, D1, and um, they're meetings per semester. So the earlier we start, the more comprehensive and easier it is for you to um, get everything organized. And so when you know, June, July, August rolls around prior to your senior year, you already have a lot of it in place and then we can, you know, hit the ground running um, with the essays and the applications and, and get things going. So again, those are all the various options that I have um, and um, here are um, all of our contact information and now we are going to dive in to those questions. But first I wanted to um, welcome everybody back onto screen so we can, um, ask all the questions. And um, one thing I wanted to um, just mention, Marie had um, discussed, um, oh, I'd get, I forgot what you called it. Um, at both of my boys' schools and some of the students that I've worked with, they call it intercession. You called it? Inner term. Inner term. Um, because of intercession, I had one son actually graduate an entire year early. Um, he took intercession every single year. Um, and sometimes one or two courses, um, which, you know, he was a science-y major, and so that's when he took his humanities, because he didn't want to do that um, during the year when he was, you know, taking organic, organic chemistry, biochem, molecular biology, all of those things. He didn't have the time that it required to read and write and do all of that, because he was so focused on those other things, so he did intercession. And as Marie um, said, um, that was included in tuition. We didn't have to pay, the, you know, an extra fee for that intercession. And it was, you know, it was like, wow, which then in the end saved us a whole year of tuition. Um, well, kind of. He's now in grad school. So, um, but he's getting, you know, a graduate degree in four years instead of five or six. So it does save money in the end to take advantage of the various programs that the schools have with regards to um, intercession um, or inner term and uh, I'm sure uh, Kelsey and Jamie can speak to their institutions and whether or not there is something similar to that um, at their schools and how that works for various programs um, so if you would like to um, you know speak to that and then I will get into some of the questions that have come up I will read them to you so if you want to speak to the intercession inner term thing and then we can move on I guess so for some of our students, we do have an opportunity for them to just take summer courses. I know we don't have anything, um, we don't do interterm or intercession, but we have had students who graduate in three years by just simply taking summer quarter because our, our system is divided up into the quarter system. They do correlate with the season. So we have fall, winter, spring, summer. If students end up taking all four of those for three years, they will graduate in that three year period. 
Um, so there is that opportunity for them as well. A lot of students like to take advantage of that if they're highly motivated and very driven. We also have something called Grad Path that we launched, I believe it was late last year. Um, which will actually allow students to graduate in three years with their bachelor's degree and then get their master's in one one year as well. So we kind of have if students are interested in getting a master's on top of their bachelor's in a four year period. We have expedited tracks like that as well. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, Kelsey. Yeah, so um, not uh, uh, anything as exciting as what Chapman has. That's really cool. Um, <laughs> but we do also have uh, summer opportunities um, like Jamie was speaking to. Something unique to CU Boulder is I guess we have a May semester and then we have two summer terms and then an August semester. So four opportunities um, to take uh, classes over the summer. Um, that's not even speaking to uh, study abroad experiences, which right right now is like how you know is that a possibility? But I know a lot of people like to go abroad in the summer, so then they can get classes out of the way, you know, still graduate on time or perhaps earlier, depending on that timeline. And is usually um, more affordable for out of state students compared to their tuition um, to go abroad for a semester or over the summer. So that's cool about that. Okay. All right. So some of the questions that came up, they came up, Kelsey, during your presentation. So I don't know if they are specific to um, a CU Boulder or we can go ahead and ask them across the board. Um, one of them was from Max and um, he wanted to know, um, do you prefer who writes your letter of recommendation? Yeah. So I said the term, right? Academic letter of recommendation. What that really means is uh, we want to see you um, in a, like a classroom setting or from an advisor, right, who knows you in a school setting. So not from like a coach or from like a club or anything um, affiliated outside of school. But um, you can always submit more than one letter um, if you do want a coach or someone like that to also submit one. So if it is, so I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Max maybe was asking if it was an academic letter, does it matter if it's coming from like a math or science person or a humanities person or English or um, should it be um, like say it was somebody who wanted to go into STEM, should they be getting a letter from their physics or biology or anatomy physiology teacher or could it come from their English teacher, does that matter? I would say no, but it's also, it depends on what you want to be highlighted in your um, application, right? I know for me applying to CU Boulder, I definitely talked to my English teachers because my degree was in English and I was like, show them this is my passion, write about this, so, you know, so up to you. It doesn't matter from our perspective, but we'd love to see that extra passion, you know, if you want to go into that field. Okay. Thank you. Marian, Jamie, would you like to um, speak to that for... Um your institution please yeah i'd say as long as it's somebody that really knows you well in that academic sphere then then that's okay there's not a particular person that i would necessarily recommend um, some of our programs i will mention require what we call a creative letter of recommendation and so if that if you're applying to a film program or one of our arts programs or something along those lines there might be a letter of recommendation that's required in addition to a regular academic letter of rec um, that goes with the main portion of your application, that extra piece would go um, seen by the faculty members that are stri strictly looking at your portfolio or what we call creative supplement materials. Well, I do say you can technically add in more letters of recommendation. I will tell students to often be careful with how many you're submitting. I've seen some students submit from two to six or eight of them. Um, once you're submitting a, a larger number of them, they really do start to become just so similar that it's hard to differentiate the content from one letter of recommendation from another. So pick those couple of people that are really key for you that are going to best talk about your experience, what you're going to bring to campus, how you are as a learner, um, any key elements that you wanna, you know, want to really shine in your application. Um, Pick those just a couple of people to, to help you. Thank you. So I think for SCAD, um, we limit ours to, to one to three letters of recommendation per student, just because kind of as Marie said, at a certain point, they get very repetitive. Um, in terms of who the letters come from, we ask that, I mean, they can technically come from anybody as long as they're not a family member or a friend, but it needs to be somebody with whom you have immediate contact. So somebody who can speak to your work ethic, your motivation, your passion, your skills, 
um, you know, different things like that, that they can really kind of share what you bring to the table or what the student will bring to the table um, as an applicant and hopefully as a potential SCAD student in the future if they get accepted. So, you know, again, just kind of highlighting those different things, but overall, it, nobody specific that I would recommend. Um, just, you know, they could be from current employers, it could be a teacher, it could be a counselor, um, somebody, a community leader, anybody along those lines, but is they have to have had immediate contact with the student. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, I have, um, when do your RD decisions come out? So that was, uh, that was posted, at Kelsey, as you were um, speaking. I think you were speaking to early action and you said you'll find out in January. And so the question popped up with regards to um, regular decisions. When are they released? And um, I will let you all speak to that if it is something that you can um, address. Yeah, absolutely. So early action deadline, November 15th, you find out as early as um, January, we will say before February 1. And then regular decision deadline is January 15th, you find out your admission decision before April 1. So definitely a difference there. Thank you. Ours are um, a little bit similar. If a student is applying early decision, you'll definitely hear from us by mid-December. If you're applying early action, it depends on what individual program you're applying to. So if you are applying to a program that requires an audition, then that might take a little bit longer if you scheduled an in per if you get called back for an in-person audition and then schedule that past December, then you might hear a little bit later into the later winter months or early spring. So that's a little bit tentative depending on when you schedule that. Most early action students, though, also hear back from us in mid-December, and then our regular decision students is typically early to mid-March. Okay, so I believe I mentioned this when we were talking about admission, but for SCAD, we don't have set deadlines, um, aside from the 130 days prior to the beginning of the start of the quarter in which they want to enroll. We can really get students' admission decisions within as little as two to four weeks once we, once we have all the necessary materials. So it's a pretty quick turnaround there. Um, so yeah, it just depends. It's more dependent on the student when they submit those materials. All right, thank you. Rolling admissions, I love those. <laughs> I love working with my students and it's like, you know what, let's get that one in and be done and it's off the table and we don't need to look at it again. Um, so um, let's look at some, I had a couple that were submitted prior to the webinar um, and one was tips for portfolio. Can you give some, can you all um, speak to that? I know obviously, Jamie, you can probably tell us a lot about that and I know Marie, um, but you know, Kelsey also with, um, what the programs that you have to offer at CU Boulder. Um, so any tips for portfolios? I guess I'll go first in that order. Okay. Um, so we do not require portfolios um, during the application process. So that checklist is everything you need to submit unless you are applying for the College of Music, then you will have some um, kind of extra work to do there for auditioning. Um, should you want to always submit more materials, like I said, if that's after the Common App or during that process, you can always email me that. I always recommend that if you are looking into environmental design or engineering, you want to show some of that work, you can absolutely do so, but not required. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna grab a link for you all so that you can see what will be required. Um, I'll post it in the chat in just a second, but it really depends on the major that you're coming into. Some of our um, performing arts programs have a callback process. So you submit a video audition and then we do a callback and, and can move forward from there. Um, some, some programs are submit certain documents or submit um, these letters of recommendation and their writing prompts. If you're a screenwriter and that's an interest of yours, it's gonna be all writing prompts. If you're a film production student, there's going to be a two minute video. So it, it depends on, on which program and I'll post that, but please know that these are things that we're updating over the summer right now. So please don't create your whole portfolio based on what is posted on the website at this very moment. It is something that we're in the process of working through to do revisions before the new application goes live in August. In terms of um, any letter, any recommendations that I that I have is 
just be very specific in following the instructions. Um, I have seen some students um, in film, for example, that submit over a two minute video and the faculty are like, nope, they're not following the instructions. Then how is that going to look as you're then in that classroom um, and following the instructions that are given to you for a particular project? So be sure that you're really following to them to the T um, is my, my best recommendation. Great, thank you, Marie. Um, all right, so where SCAD is concerned, we also do not require a portfolio for admission, which I think surprises a lot of people, just given the fact that we are we are an art and design school. Um, but our thought process behind it is we want to use it for scholarship enhancement for students. We don't not want to necessarily incorporate it into uh, the deciding factor to whether or not a student can come to SCAD, because usually their passion and motivation will be evidenced in other areas. So we look at those before we look at the portfolio. But the portfolio, not to say it's not important, important, but it is uh, not the determining factor in whether or not you get in, but it is incredibly helpful when it does come to scholarships and we want to reward those students who, who, who have had opportunity in high school, who have applied themselves, have been able to take advantage of great art programs, um, but then also we don't want to penalize students who maybe didn't have those same opportunities, but have the drive and willingness to learn. For our portfolios, we have six different categories that students can choose from. You will se select one category. And then kind of like Marie said as well, it's very important that you adhere to those requirements for that portfolio category. A lot of students kind of want to create their own categories and that just doesn't really work with the review committee. So <laughs> be, be very, um, just follow those, those requirements to a T. I'm gonna go ahead and post the requirements in the chat as well. So students who are interested in learning how to compile a portfolio, those should be some helpful tips for y'all. Um, in terms of the categories, we want you to select the one that you think will showcase your best work, what you feel most proud of and most confident in as an artist currently. It doesn't have to reflect what you wanna study at SCAD. It just has to be a reflection of what, what you're most proud of and what you feel like will be the strongest representation of what you can can do now. So that's more important to us than asking you to compile a portfolio of work in an area that you have maybe had little to no experience in yet. So you have a choice between visual art portfolio, which would be 10 to 20 pieces of your strongest visual art pieces. Um, usually I say to cap it around 10 to 15, going to 20 is a lot and usually leaves room for a lot of fluff. And fluff is gonna be work that is not necessarily your strongest, but it's just stuff that you felt pressured to add in because you thought you had to hit the 20 cap, but you don't. So just make it your best, hit 10 for sure, and then call it a day um, if you're not feeling confident in the rest of the work that you have to submit. Then you also have a visual time-based media combo. So if you have some film work or sound design work, you can submit about a three minute reel and then you can do 10 visual art pieces or you can do solely time-based media, which is giving you um, three to five minutes to showcase a reel or you can do a writing portfolio, which is five to 15 pages of your strongest writing samples. We have an equestrian uh, video submission as well, because we have an equestrian team okay. and yeah, a program as well. And equestrian it's very random, <laughs> <laughs> but we have an equestrian studies program and an equestrian team and the team is actually really good. So if any horse people are out there, we have a great um, team as well. And then you can submit a video of you showing your horse. And then the final portfolio category would be performing arts. So for any students who feel that is their strongest skill, they can select that category. Wow, great, thank you. I learned something again today. Yay. <laughs> Um, all right, we have another one from an anonymous attendee. Um, I think this goes back to admit rates with regards to early, well, I know it does, um, early and regular decision. Um, and I know I get that question a lot. Is it better to apply early or regular decision? You know, does it give me advantage? Does it not? Um, so basically the question is, what are the admit rates for early versus regular decision for the schools that have the early deadlines? Do you have a percentage that you are able to share? That's a really good question. Um, I don't have <laughs> specifics for each deadline, um, but I will say overall, CU Boulder has an 82% acceptance rate. And then I will say a little bit more about the deadlines. Like the reason why I recommend the early action one so much, again, is we are admitting you before we look at everyone else. Um, and so while uh, you know, we are really forming our class in the early action pool. Um, so that's just something to think about where is, you know, it's not necessarily lower in the regular decision pool because, you know, we want to, we waitlist a lot of applicants in regular decisions so we can 
give them, you know, the best opportunities and try to, you know, pull on them as long as we can and give them a spot if we can. But with those early action folks, sometimes that's not always possible. So um, I hope that it gives a little bit more insight about that process, but I don't actually have the specifics for that. That's a good question. Okay, thank you. Marie? Yeah, ours, so our early action is typically right around our average. So it's about 55%. And then I've seen that fluctuate anywhere from maybe seven to 10% less in regular decision. Every year is a little bit different. So it's hard to say what every upcoming year will look like. It's certainly gonna depend on the applicants we get and, and how that all shapes out in that individual applicant pool. But um, that's a good thing to keep in mind. And then some programs do have a higher level of selectivity if we have a limited number of seats in those individual programs. So not every individual program falls into that. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the acceptance rate um, for every single major on campus, but at least I hope that provides a little more context. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Um, so, and Jamie, I don't think that that is a thing for you because you guys are rolling admissions, so it doesn't matter, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't really apply to us. <laughs> okay. Um, so question with regards to, um, are this, these juniors, rising seniors and their last, um, semester of schools going grades, um, pass, no pass, um, students choosing to opt in or opt out or the school making it a decision. How is that going to factor in with regards to um, looking at now that you have gone, I mean, Kelsey, I know that you guys aren't quite there yet with regards to test optional, um, but not having that aspect of test scores and now you're not going to truly have second semester of junior year if there are no grades and they're applying early action and now you don't have seventh semester grades of senior year. How is that all going to get put into the evaluation holistic process? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of changes. Um, so um, one thing I, I will say that we get um, is your high school profile. That's something that comes um, very easily with your transcript. So we are familiar with your schools, right? We know what the curriculum looks like, what you look like in, you know, relation to your classmates, your uh, county, things of that nature. Um, and that's also where that holistic review process kind of comes in handy there. We're looking at trends, right? So uh, lucky for a lot of the folks who are the rising seniors, we do have some academics to go off of, which is great. Um, and again, with that kind of holistic review, wanting to know the full picture, you're more than just a number. If, you know, I recognize a lot of students had trouble with that transition um, that came very last minute to online to pass fail. Uh, if you struggled with that or you're like, this is not a reflection of who I am, X, Y, Z, whatever the case may be, just chat with me. Um, I recognize that that's out of your control and it may be, or if it is in your control and that may benefit you. Um, so that's not something that I'm initially concerned about. Um, hoping for, yeah, test optional <laughs> this year, um, but that's kind of what that looks like for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One of the other things I'll add into that conversation, I think Kelsey, crushed it and like, like that that's the case like we're going to see the context of your of your application we're looking for the trends all of those things are right on in holistic admission um one of the other things that we're going to see too is what classes you're recommended for in your senior year so even if you have a pass no pass in your spring of your junior year we can't tell if that's an a b c d grade or, or 100 point scale what that looks like but we can see oh if you went from college prep or honors level english say in that spring of junior year to an ap level and you were recommended for that i'm of the assumption that you did really well in that course and so you're moving and progressing forward so all about the context and we're looking into the schedule and looking at the rigor that you're taking in addition to the individual grades that you're getting. So um, it's okay if you have pass, no pass, we're, we're looking at that right now for our students that are graduating seniors. So it's something we very much know how to handle and we'll be um, continuing to work through. Great, thank you. So I think um, 
I'm going to have to reiterate everything that Marie and Kelsey said. They did great jobs. <laughs> uh, but to kind of go along those lines, every student will be evaluated on a case by case basis. So I also am not very concerned. I know for a student who's about to graduate uh, high school next year, I know that this everything, this entire experience can be very disconcerting and very, uh, there's just a ton of uncertainty surrounding it. But our entire admission department has made a ton of adjustments. We did waive the SAT, ACT test requirements for fall 2020. It's not officially waived for fall 2021, but those conversations are being had. And we're kind of taking our cues from the feedback that we're getting from our students. And so we're trying to figure out also what our educators are doing, um, how we can better support their students because educators across the US, every area or every region seems to be different right now in terms of what, how they're handling this and whether or not they're going to pass fail or how they're handling grade systems. So we want to be fair to, to, to our students. Um, we've made a ton of accommodations and I think we're just gonna continue doing that. So I don't think the students next year need to be very concerned about that. Great, so with that test optional, another question. So if converting to test optionals and um, test scores are now not gonna be part of calculating um, admission, but they are still going to be for merit aid, um, how is that going to be handled if there's you know, for example, if a student is unable to take one, are, will they not be eligible for the merit aid because they don't have that piece to submit? How, how is that going to, you know, going to, you know, they're choosing test optional um, because they're forced to choose it, not because it's something that there, there's just no testing center. Um, you all know where we're located. We're on the central, the central coast. So we're between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And um, having testing centers in this area is already a, a, a somewhat of an issue. So students have to drive 45 minutes to an hour to, um, to get to a testing center. Um, so when testing does come back, they're going to go to those highly populated um, dense populations where they're going to be able to accommodate larger student bodies. And so I may have a student that would have to travel three hours to get to a testing center. And that's just not something that is feasible to ask of someone. Um, so if they're unable to sit for an exam, what will merit aid consideration look like? Yeah, for us, um, as I, you know, was very upfront about when I started my presentation, unfortunately, we uh, hadn't really had these conversations before because C Boulder had their hands tied with, with Colorado, um, just like education law uh, requiring us to meet those scores for admissions. And so um, while yes, those merit um, scholarships do require those scores, I would say, you know, as of right now, not knowing what we can do on that front, um, cast your net wide. You know, this is speaking to all colleges, right? Like don't be afraid to seek out other scholarship opportunities and I mentioned that that November one scholarship application opened for CU Boulder, you know, those really vary from the donors um, who um, are sponsoring those scholarships. So not all of them require those scores. So definitely just do your research there, find out what scholarships you can be applying for um, and know that there are at least CU Boulder definitely opportunities on campus as well with those scholarships um, in addition to first year applying. Great, thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, because we're moving into test optional, we are, um, you don't need test scores to be considered for merit. That's automatically going to be a piece for us. And again, it's going to go back to that ultimate like context of your application to take a look. Merit scholarships for us range 10,000 to 32,000. Um, and I will piggyback off of what Kelsey just mentioned too. Like, please, please be active in applying to outside scholarships. It's a conversation that I have with many students and families, typically in the months of April, um, March and April, as they're making a decision before the like, big national college deadline for many institutions on May 1st and they're asking about other scholarships and some will come from us and there are other opportunities from Chapman as well in addition to just merit-based scholarship but please be active in those other ones too. Um, it's important that you're um, kind of buying into this process too and that you're self-advocating. Thank you Marie. 
So along those lines, I think, you know, we're still obviously having conversations about what this is going to look like for next year for this past uh, for the, our incoming fall students. Um, there have been no changes in terms of merit based scholarships and eligibility. And I don't foresee next year being much different either. Obviously, those conversations are still being had. Um, if we did go to test optional, we can still make merit based scholar scholarship decisions off of their their final GPAs or high school transcripts, things like that. And also, I think phone interviews are going to also start playing an important role in kind of these merit based scholarship decisions as well. So, um, and also resumes are such a big part of it too. So I've been really encouraging my students to get creative and trying to figure out different things that they can do to beef up their resume um, to add to that, whether it be community service, any extracurriculars or just being creative or maximizing the time that they do have while they're at home right now, whether it's taking different online classes or certifications and things like that, that they can really add to that to enhance just, you know, opportunity to kind of show us like this is who I am as a student. This is what I'm bringing into SCAD. Um, but overall, I, I don't see we're not going to take scholarship opportunity away from students. So that's that's kind of the, the main thing that I'm trying to say. Great. So I had one last question that was submitted um, during the registration, um, an interesting one. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to ask it. So if a student discloses that they're dyslexic during the college application, will it negatively impact the student's admission opportunity? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I was like, "Where's the mute button?" <laughs> right? <laughs> um, uh, no, uh, we uh, you know we cannot consider that in the application process actually. Um, but you know, if you want to you know share that information with us, you know, like again going back to that holistic review, you're like, "Hey, that AP class was just not for me," and here are the reasons why, and um, maybe disclose the help that you received or accommodations, and see that you know, that positive change, that's stuff we want to reward you for, um, but negatively affect you, no, and um, not give you extra points or anything like that either. We can't look at it in that sense, but if it's to lift you up um, and show your progress, absolutely. Yeah, same thing here. If you're, if you're disclosing that, you're, you're welcome to. We can't look at any official disability documentation until a student has been, um, it offered admission or is, is being placed in a class and that goes directly to disability services. I wouldn't see that since I don't have a trained understanding of what those things mean. Um, but if you wanted to include that in like an essay as a um, show of like resiliency or something of how you got through a particular challenge moving forward, you're certainly welcome to. It would not impact your admission. And it'll be the same for SCAD as well. So these are things that the student can, you know, share. It's not going to be a question on the application. It's something that they would share separately with an advisor. And we do have a lot of support services for students who maybe need additional accommodations, but that's information they have to come to us with first. Um, so it doesn't play into the admission decision whatsoever. The only thing that I would say, I know that we chatted about this briefly earlier, is that if it, if it has caused a student to have very low grades, um, then that's the only time that it would send up red flags and be concerning for us, worried more about the student's potential performance at the school um, more than anything else. So we'd want to make sure that SCAD was the right fit for them and, uh, you know, the, we're they were going to be able to handle the rigor. So we wouldn't want to ever put a student in a position where they aren't going to perform well. I always tell my students that I said the the people on the other end who are reading your applications, they're not trying to find reasons not to admit you. They're trying to find reasons to admit you. Um, so they're not sitting down going check, check, check. Nope. Um, that is not what um, they're doing. They have a, they, they don't know who's on the other end. And that's part of what I love what I'm doing right now. They now have a face to see you guys are people just like the rest of us. Um, and you smile and you laugh and you look just like us and you're sitting in the same types of rooms as us, right? On your other end of the Zoom call. Um, and so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to reach out to them and ask them. They're there to help you. Um, I'm here to help you. So, um, and again, nobody is looking for a reason not to admit you. 
Um, they are wanting to make sure that where you're applying is going to be the best fit. Are you going to do well at their institution? And they know about, Kelsey knows about her institution, Marie knows about her institution, Jamie knows about her institution. So they may see that there is something about what you are putting in your application that they need more information on to make sure that where you're going to go is going to be a fit for you so that you can thrive there. Um, nobody wants to have a student um, whether it be a parent, yourself, or the admissions, or teachers, or faculty, or anyone, um, want to see a student struggle once they get to college. Um, you know, that's the last thing anybody wants. So we want to find you that right fit to begin with. Um, so doing all of the research that they all talked about, doing the research that I talked about with regards to finding fit, what's your learning style, what do you want to do, what are your natural aptitudes, what are all those things, we do all of that research during prior to the application process so that we can then narrow that list down to get you to, um, you know, have a balanced list of, you know, places that will be a good fit for you. So. Um, um, so I'm going to get, get throw, throw it out there to um, those that are still, we've, we've had some people dwindle off. Um, so um, those of you that are still here, if you have any questions for Jamie, Marie, or Kelsey, please throw that out now, whether you do it in the chat box or in the, some of you put it in the chat box, some of you put it in the Q&A. So um, either one of those is totally fine. I think I answered Max's question, which he put into the chat box, and I answered um, the other questions that came into um, the Q&A box, and I don't see any of them that I didn't answer. Yeah, so anyone else? This is your chance. Okay, I don't see anything. Um, so next week, um, is a special presentation for the parents. Um, it is a mental health um, piece um, in stress and stress management and how to support your student or child um, through the process. Um, Mr. Paul Royer will be presenting. Um, he presented for the students last week um, and he'll be presenting to the parents next week um, on how to approach this sometimes very stressful time of admissions. Um, and now with having a piece of, um, you know, COVID and the pandemic and the world the way it is, adding a little bit more stress. And so how to um, manage those um, stressful situations um, in order to have some positive outcomes in the relationships um, that you have. So um, for parents only, and then we've got, um, I don't know how many sessions, they're going until September 8th. So between now and September 8th, Every Tuesday at 1130 in the morning, we've got a College Talk Summer Series, and I have three different institutions presenting to you. So I can't thank you enough, Kelsey, Marie, and Jamie. Again, our contact information is on the screen. All of that is um, email for, um, for everyone. I think I have it up for everyone. Yes, I do. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. And if you have any um, questions, you can email us. And I'm sure, um, uh, you know, I know that Kelsey, Marie, and Jamie will get back to you. And so will I. I, I emailed them and they got back to me. So they will do so for you also. So if we have no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to call it a day. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> have a great day. Bye. Bye.